Hi, everybody. This is Advocate Lucinda, your empowerment lawyer. Some people have asked me questions about police misconduct. So I want to talk about malicious prosecution, what it is, and the elements of proof. You want to hear this. So let's take this scenario. We are at the mall. To our left, we have mom and dad holding baby, watching a police officer as he escorted an individual out of the mall handcuffed. Well, here are the facts. The individual was in the store and an employee accused him of stealing. He called the police and here we see arrested him as mom and dad watch. Now, mom and dad were in the store at the time of the alleged theft. Now, here are important facts you need to know. The accused had no property on his person at the time of his arrest. The police did not question the employee that made the accusation. The police did not question the family that was in the store, although the family told the police officer they were there and did not see the individual take any items. And the police did not read the accused his Miranda warning. And at all times, the accused stated he's innocent. Is this malicious prosecution? Hmm. Let's see. Federal malicious prosecution has three elements of proof. Probable cause, deprivation, termination. And we will look at these individually. When I say federal malicious prosecution, I'm referring to the accused suing the state and or the police officer that arrested him under 42 USC 1983. I provided you with a case in the Sixth Circuit Federal Court, Sykes versus Anderson. It will help you to understand malicious prosecution and even help you to come to a decision as to whether the gentleman we just looked at was wrongfully arrested and whether the officer engaged in malicious prosecution. So let's look at these three elements a little more closely. Malicious prosecution, what is it? Well, these three elements must be present. Probable cause. When the officer made the arrest in this scenario, did he have probable cause? It is when the officer lacks probable cause or the absence of probable cause. It's when the state initiates criminal action against the accused without justification or probable cause. Deprivation. The accused is deprived of his or her liberty interests as a result of the malicious prosecution. And we are going to talk more about the liberty interests a little later in this presentation. And the third element, there must be a termination. The prosecution against the accused must be terminated in his or her favor. And we're going to talk more about that later on in the presentation. The Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, defines probable cause as where the facts 
and circumstances within the officer's knowledge and of which they have reasonably trustworthy information are sufficient in themselves to warrant a belief by a man or officer of reasonable caution that a crime is being committed. Now, remember those facts I gave you earlier? Did this officer have reasonably trustworthy information? Were they sufficient to cause him to believe that the man stole from the mall? Think about that. Well, the liberty interest that we're talking about is an individual's right not to be seized or searched without probable cause. And that right is secured by the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now question, in your mind, have you determined whether this officer that arrested the gentleman at the mall, did he violate his Fourth Amendment right? Hmm, let's go further. Here I want to introduce the 14th Amendment to you as the cousin to the Fourth Amendment. And I'm focusing on the due process and equal protection clauses. In part, the 14th Amendment states, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Do you see the similarities between the two? On one hand, the Fourth Amendment focuses on the accused right not to be searched and or seized without probable cause. Whereas the 14th Amendment seems to be a wider net and that it prohibits the state from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process and without providing equal protection of the laws. Their similarities, but they're different. Remember the termination must be in the accused favor. This tells it all, doesn't it? We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty but wait, there's more. Recently in April 2022, the United States Supreme Court determined that Fourth Amendment claims under Section 1983 for malicious prosecution, a plaintiff does not need to show that he or she was acquitted. All they need to show is that their prosecution ended without a conviction. Now, that's good news to a plaintiff and plaintiff's attorneys, because in many instances where the prosecutor knows that he or she do not have a case, they would drop it. Well, based on the Supreme Court's ruling, that's sufficient. Good news. Now, 
Most states, if not all, allows for an accused to sue for malicious prosecution. Generally, in states, malice must be proven. But the party would want to review the elements of proof for that state. And whether the individual is filing a federal malicious prosecution lawsuit or a state lawsuit, case law should be read from each. For example, in the federal court, remember there are numerous circuits. Case law from that circuit should be read. Now, it does not mean that an individual cannot read other case law from different circuits because sometimes they provide good information that one can use to frame their brief. However, in the brief, certainly the author should include cases from that circuit. And the same with state, read cases and the law from that state. And by all means, always read the jurisdiction's local rules. In some cases where the accused files a malicious prosecution lawsuit in the federal court will also include state claims, such as emotional distress, for example. In that case, the individual would want to invoke the jurisdictional statute 28 USC section 1367 because it gives the federal court power to hear state claims that the court would not otherwise have. And also let me remind you that you can conduct research for free. In a video that I did back some time ago entitled Finding Case Law, I actually give you a map in the shape of the United States and you can click the circuit in which your lawsuit is filed. And from there, you can begin to conduct research on case law. Okay, so I put the link down below in the event you'd like to go back and visit that video. I will also place it in the description page of this video. Okay, until next time, be M. <laughs>